Yo, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of the SWUS Friday Night College Football. We've got three matchups here. We're going to go through all of them in this video. Stanford, Syracuse up first, then Illinois, Nebraska. Got a Big Ten game there, big one. Uh, then San Jose State, Washington State. Let's go. Welcome to the SWUS. The SWUS. Hey, get the sewers. All right, first up, Stanford on the road in Syracuse for this one. The Orange Lane, eight and a half, which has been bought down from nine and a half. I thought we were going to be able to get a Stanford plus 10 in there. Didn't happen. Uh, total sitting at 56 and a half. That number's been bought down from 58 and a half. So let's go ahead and get into this one, and we'll start with the pie charts. Uh, according to this data, which I don't trust at all, actions coming in on Syracuse, 80% of the bets on the orange. But look at the bottom row. The bottom, th uh, the bottom row is the money percentage here all over Syracuse in the beginning. But on Thursday, looks like some sharp action starting to come in on Stanford, which would be in line with the line being bought down from 9.5 to 8.5. But again, take this data with a grain of salt. All right, well, what do we think of this matchup? Um, well, entering the season, I had said I was concerned about the Syracuse defense, specifically the defensive front. This was not a great run defense last year. They were 73rd in effective rush, 99th in run defense success rate, 53rd in yards per carry allowed. They got a brand new coaching staff here. Fran Brown takes over as head coach, Elijah Robinson coaching the defense. They had lost their entire defensive line from last year, all four starters gone. So entering the season, I was a little concerned about the Syracuse defensive front, which is why I said I was leaning towards Ohio plus 17 and a half in the week one show because I expect Ohio to be able to run the ball on this brand new Syracuse defensive front and I was right in that respect they had 255 yards six but six and a half yards per carry two rushing touchdowns on the road in Syracuse in the opener so right out of the gate it was looking like I was pretty spot on with my take here but then Syracuse bounced back in a big way at home against Georgia Tech one of the better rushing attacks in the country this is an offense that was a borderline top 25 rushing attack last year they brought back most of the production on the offensive line they bring back their star running back they bring back their quarterback Haynes King who can also run the ball and they did a pretty good job against them 24 carries 112 yards 4.7 yards per carry now that's not shutting the run down but against Georgia Tech coming off a game where you were run all over by the Ohio Bobcats yeah they'll definitely take that not to mention they won this game outright and Stanford's run game is nothing compared to the Georgia Tech run game Georgia Tech 46th in effective rush 22nd in OFEI Stanford in eight is 88th and 84th so by that logic Stanford should be able to run the ball in Syracuse but even though Syracuse defense put out a great effort against Georgia Tech this is still not a defense that I trust they're still missing a ton of production from last year and they still have a brand new coaching staff look at their numbers on the season granted it's only been two games but 82nd in yards per play allowed 118th in success rate and if you you combine the Georgia Tech and the Ohio games together look at their run defense numbers they're 120th in the country in yards per carry allowed 113th in success rate 110th in effective rush now their pass defense numbers look okay but Ohio can't throw the ball they're not Parker Navarro that's not going to be much of a passing attack this year and Haynes King actually was able to throw the ball a little bit on Syracuse the reason I'm bringing that up is for the first time this season Syracuse is going to see an offense that's trying to throw the ball Stanford 51st in pass frequency obviously the main piece of this offense is Ashton Daniels the quarterback not that they don't try to run the ball I mean they did have 37 carries against TCU in the opener 121 yards just 3.3 yards per carry but this is a team that wants to throw the ball this is a team that wants the ball in Ashton Daniels hands and like I said Haynes King was pretty good in that Syracuse game 29 to 39 266 pass yards a touchdown 140.1 passer rating but to take it a step further he was active with his legs as well. Six carries, 67 yards, two rushing touchdowns. In fact, him breaking those rushing touchdowns is what kept that game close at the end. Why is that significant? Because Ashton Daniels is an athlete. Here are his passing numbers on the year. They're okay. 384 passing yards in two games, 6.6 .6 yards per attempt, three touchdowns, one interception. He protects the football, A-plus turnover-worthy play rate. In their opener against TCU, who's a pretty solid defense, 17 of 35, 163 yards, one touchdown, one pick, and 91.4 passer rating. But look what he does on the ground he's averaging 59 rushing yards per game and four and a half yards per carry that's what was killing Syracuse in that Georgia Tech game Haynes King made a couple huge plays with his legs Ashton Daniels is more than capable of doing the same thing keep in mind this is a 
Chiefs offense that's only going to improve as the season progresses. They brought back all five starters on their offensive line from last year, and this is Stanford. Yeah, this program's not in the best of shape right now, but this is a program that's developed a lot of NFL offensive linemen, so bringing back all five starters from last year, not to mention it's not just the offensive line, they bring back a ton of production. They're second in the entire country in returning production. They brought back their star receiver. Everyone's back. So even though stock is at an all-time low when it comes to this Stanford team, bringing back all five offensive linemen, bringing back all the production against a Syracuse defense that I don't think is very good, I like them to score here. I think they're going to be able to move the ball. Now, I know the 27 points they scored on TCU is a little bit misleading. They got the cover. I was on Stanford. I was happy with it, but they were outgained by about 200 yards in that game. But like I said, I expect this offensive line to continue to improve as the season progresses. Uh, so I like Stanford to be able to move the ball. I don't think the Syracuse defense is very good. On the other side, we got the Syracuse offense, and this is where we got to give them some flowers because Kyle McCord looks great. Eight touchdowns, one interception, eight and a half yards per pass attempt. Looking pretty good across the board here. He absolutely smoked Georgia Tech. 32 of 46, 381 yards, four touchdowns, no picks. Syracuse plus three was one of my top bets that week. I was loving every single snap of this game. He looks great. The Syracuse offense is looking pretty good. 40th in OFEI, 21st in yards per play, 31st in success rate, 32nd in yards per pass attempts sixth in passing success rate rushing numbers are lacking a little bit just 110th at effective rush but LaQuint Allen is still there so I actually expect Syracuse to run the ball as well even though these numbers don't really indicate that uh, nothing negative to say about the Syracuse offense they look good keep in mind this is a Stanford defense that let Josh Hoover cook on them 28 of 42 353 yards two touchdowns no picks a 65.1 QBR really not much I can say here as far as Stanford making stops against the Syracuse offense they're coming off a bot well both these teams are coming off a of bye, not just Syracuse. I expect the Stanford defense to really struggle to make stops in this one. Syracuse should put up a big number on the scoreboard. But like I said, I expect the Stanford offense to make some plays and put some points up themselves. So before you go laying the points with Syracuse here, check out this trend. Teams coming off a conference upset win, which is Syracuse. They upset Georgia Tech. They were underdogs in that game. Laying more than seven points in a non-conference game. Five and six straight up and one and ten against the spread last year. Now, I should mention there's been four instances of this this year and they're three and one so this year this trend has not worked but last year one in ten against the number really don't want to play Syracuse here it's not just because of this trend I mean I'm not really worried about this I, I just thought it was interesting to be honest uh, but I do think Syracuse is going to score some points so where I want to go with this is the over the problem is this number's been bet down from 58 and a half to 56 and a half meaning there's some sharp money evidently coming in on the under I'm just going to wait it out, probably play the over before kickoff. So maybe get a 56, 55 and a half. I'm looking to play the over here. Next up, we got Illinois on the road in Nebraska. Huskers laying seven and a half points at home. Total sitting at 42 and a half. Let's go ahead and get into this one. And we'll start with the pie charts. According to this data that I don't trust, Publix on Illinois here. Over 75% of the tickets on the Illini. A little bit of sharp money in on Nebraska, according to this data. Obviously, take it with a grain of salt. So what do we think of this matchup here? Uh, well, both these teams off to some hot starts. Illinois, 3-0, 2-0 one against the spread. Nebraska, 3-0, 3-0 against the spread. So if you've been betting these two teams, you're up. They've been winning. They've been covering. Luke Altmaier off to a great start this season. Over 69% completion, six touchdowns, no picks. Over 164 passer rating. That's 69.2% completions. Much better than his previous three seasons. Definitely off to the best start of his career. And I know going on the road against this Nebraska defense isn't ideal, but Luke Altmaier was a road warrior last year, man. Look at his split. 67% completions on the road. Better than his numbers at home. Touchdown interception ratio, 7-4 to four on the road, 6-6 to six at home. Passer rating significantly better on the road. And specifically, he was better in road conference games, road Big Ten games. Look at the completion percentage, yards per game, touchdown interceptions. Much better in his road Big Ten games last year. Luke Altmaier's problem last year was dealing with pressure. His pressure to sack rate was really bad. Took a lot of sacks. Couldn't get the ball downfield. Couldn't make plays when pressured. And unfortunately, looking like he's off to the same sort of start. I mean, not quite as bad, but definitely still struggling with pressure. The reason we have to mention this is we just saw another quarterback with similar splits who struggles with pressure go on the road to Nebraska and have a tough day. Shador Sanders on the road to Nebraska, 23 of 38, 244 yards, touchdown and a pick, 21.6 QBR. Certainly not the games we 
come to expect from Shador Sanders. Nebraska defense gave him a hard time. And this Nebraska defense, it has to be respected. 12th in the country in yards per play allowed, second in yards per carry allowed, eighth in effective rush. Uh, their numbers against the pass, not quite as impressive. The weakness of this Nebraska defense is definitely the secondary. The thing is their front seven is so good that no one's been able to exploit it yet. But here's the difference between Illinois and Colorado. Illinois has got an offensive line. In fact, this might be one of the better offensive lines in the Big Ten. Now that Nick Saban has retired, I was talking about this a couple weeks ago, Brett Bielema, the head coach for Illinois, has sent more offensive linemen to the NFL than any other head coach in college football. This is a program that's proven they could develop NFL offensive linemen, and they brought back a ton of production from last season. So I expect this Illinois offensive line to be pretty good this year, and the numbers indicate it. They're 11th in run blocking grade, 15th in stuff rate, 56th in line yards, 30th in power success rate, and more importantly, look at their pass protection numbers. 37th in pass blocking grade, first in sack rate allowed, 39th in pressure rate allowed, 36th in hurry rate allowed. The reason these pass blocking numbers are so important is we just got done talking about how the weakness of this Nebraska defense is the secondary. The problem is the pass rush is so good, the defensive front is so good, no one's been able to exploit it. Well, Illinois, that has an offensive line and might be able to give Altmaier some time in the pocket, might be the perfect offense to exploit it. Now, on the other side, we got the Nebraska offense. Uh, pretty average looking numbers here, 56 in yards per play, 52nd in yards per carry, 66 in yards per pass attempt. They're sitting at 63rd in OFEI really haven't been tested yet. They don't look great, but they don't look bad either. Offensive line definitely looks solid. Dylan Riola has not been pressured much at all, and he's taken advantage of it. Five touchdowns, one interception, over eight yards per attempt. But when he has been pressured, he's handled it well. Some nice looking splits from a clean pocket and under pressure. But like I said earlier, Dylan Riola and this Nebraska offense, they haven't been tested at all. Look at their opponent's DFEI ratings here. UTEP, 124th. Colorado, 92nd. Colorado offense is a test, but not their defense. Northern Iowa, FCS program. And now we got Illinois sitting at 39th in DFEI. Now, Illinois isn't an elite defensive program, but it's certainly by far the toughest test we've seen for Dylan Riola in this Nebraska offense. Now, if you're an Illinois fan, you should definitely be worried about the run here. They're 94th in the country in yards per carry, 86th in effective rush. Here are their defensive line metrics. They're struggling. They're, they're getting pushed around on the defensive front here. 86th in line yards, 107 seventh in stuff rate. Even in the Kansas game, which they won, they pulled the upset off. They were struggling to defend the run. Kansas had 33 carries, 186 yards in that game. That's 5.6 yards per carry. The way they won that game was Jalen Daniels was terrible. 18 of 32, 141 yards, two touchdowns, three interceptions. That's less than five yards per attempt, 33.7 QBR. So no question, Nebraska is going to be able to run the football in this game. The question is, can Dylan Riola make the plays in the situations he has to? Jalen Daniels wasn't able to. Now, credit to Illinois' defense, because last year, they were not a good unit. They still shut down Nebraska. They held them to 20 points, uh, success rate under 40%, just 4.27 yards per play. But I'm not sure if these are even relevant. I mean, this is an entirely different Nebraska offense. Obviously, there's no Dylan Riola. Jeff Sims was the quarterback at Nebraska for a lot of last year. Uh, so I don't, I don't think these are really relevant. You can see last year at this point, after week three, Nebraska's passing attack was 124th in the country. This year, it's 52nd. So clearly a difference here. There is one more thing I want to point out, though, and I'm not sure how much this factors into the bet. Andy sent it to me. I thought it was interesting. So check this out. Nebraska this year, in the first half of, game, in the first half of games, they're averaging 26.3 points per game, just 7.6 points per game in the second half. You might be thinking, ah, whatever, it's just three games, who cares? But check this out. Want to know who has one of the strongest second half defenses in the country this year? Illinois, allowing just 3.3 points per game in the second half. So maybe, I mean, maybe, if Nebraska's up at halftime, live bet Illinois, take the points. I don't know, I thought it was interesting enough to share. Um, but as far as betting this game, I'm on Illinois. I already bet it. Unfortunately, the number I got is long gone. I'm holding an Illinois plus 10 ticket. Looks like you can only get seven and a half and maybe an eight. Um, I still like Illinois. I, this would still be the side for me as long as it's more than a touchdown. So I, I think Illinois is able to keep this one close. Obviously, I like my Illinois plus 10 ticket better than an Illinois plus seven and a half ticket, but I still like Illinois. Anything more than a touchdown, I'm on, I'm on the Illini. Now let's move on to the last game. San Jose State on the road in Pullman. Washington State laying 12 or 12 and a half, depending on your sports book. Total sitting at 55 and a half or 56, depending on your sports book. Let's take a look at the pie charts. And according to this data that I don't trust, 
Public action is on Washington State with the sharp action on San Jose State. And that does make a little bit of sense because this number got bought down from 13 and a half down to 11 and a half. Looks like it hit some resistance at 11 and a half, though it's back up to 12, 12 and a half. So what do we think about this matchup? Um, well, if I'm being honest, I really don't know much about San Jose State. They brought in that Navy coach, Nia Matalolo, the guy that was with Navy for 20 years. And we were talking about it in the offseason. What are we going to expect from this San Jose State offense? I mean, are they going to start running the option? I mean, this guy was with Navy for legitimately 20 years. And that's not what we saw at all. He actually came out throwing the ball. San Jose State's 32nd in pass frequency, so just not at all what I was expecting here. But here's the thing, it's looked pretty good. I mean, they're 3-0, and 3-0 against the spread. That being said, so is Washington State. Both these teams are undefeated and undefeated against the number. So obviously something's got to give here. We'll start with the San Jose State offense. And as you can see, this is a passing unit. 28th in the country in yards per pass attempt. 25th in effective pass. 21st in passing success rate. No run game whatsoever. And that's just crazy to look at these numbers and know that the head coach of Navy for the last 20 years is running this team. And what makes this matchup especially interesting, Emmett Brown, the quarterback for San Jose State, he transferred in from from Washington State. So a little bit of a revenge angle here going on the road into Pullman, the team he was on last year. Now he only had uh, four pass attempts, so it's not like he was a major part of the Washington State team last year, but he was on the roster. Emmett Brown's been good so far this year. 915 passing yards, 8.7 yards per attempt, nine touchdowns, two picks. Now we do have to question his competition and that's pretty much the story with San Jose State. They've played legitimately no one. Sacramento State is an FCS program. Air Force is one of the worst teams in the FBS and Kennesaw State might be the worst team in the FBS. So I know we say that all the time, they've played nobody, but when it comes to San Jose State, no, they really have played nobody. Uh, but you know what? They've handled their business. They look pretty strong. So how do we feel they match up with the Washington State defense? Well, this is a weird unit because if you look at some of the yardage numbers, some of the raw data, 88th in yards per play allowed, 87th in yards per carry allowed, 67th in yards per pass attempt allowed. Certainly not good. But if you look at the scores of their games, I mean, 24-19, they only allowed 19 points to Washington. They only allowed 16 points to Texas Tech. They allowed 30 points to Portland State, but they put up 70 in that game. But here's the thing. If you look at the yardages in those games, they were moving the ball on Washington State. Portland State had 449 yards on Washington State. Texas Tech, they only scored 16 points in the game. They had almost 500 yards of offense. Washington, they only scored 19 points in the game. They had 452 yards of offense. So this Washington State defense, I mean, they've got some decent advanced metrics. I'm not saying we should go blindly by these <laughs> yardage numbers here. But by no means do I trust this unit at all. Now, granted, San Jose State's offense is the definition of unproven. They've played nobody. It's brand new, brand new coaching staff. So asking them to go on the road into Pullman and move the ball is a little bit of a tall order. But if Portland State can come in here and put up 449 yards of offense, I'd have to think that San Jose State is capable of moving the ball. Now let's flip it around and look at the Washington State offense. And they've been running the ball this year. 32nd in rushing frequency. They've done a pretty good job with it as well. 19th in yards per carry, 27th in effective rush. They're rated 20th, 28th in OFBI. So this offense has looked pretty good so far. 661 rushing yards, 6.4 yards per carry, nine rushing touchdowns, looking solid. And when we pull up the San Jose State defensive metrics, I mean, what do we do with these? San Jose State is third in the country in yards per play allowed third in the entire country 11th in yards per carry allowed fourth in yards per pass attempt allowed i mean if you look at the advanced metrics 66 in effective rush 56 in effective pass 54th in dfei suggests they're not that bad i mean obviously we can't go by these raw numbers because they've played nobody what's the strongest offense that san jose state has seen air force air Fo this is the worst air force offense we've seen in 20 years so i mean they played legitimately nobody i keep saying that because i can't stress it enough they've played nobody but here's the thing check this out you can say kind of the same thing about John Mateer, the quarterback for Washington State. And I know you might be thinking, what are you talking about? They played Washington. They played Texas Tech. Yeah, they did. And if you look at his numbers, 712 passing yards, seven touchdowns, two picks, over 10 yards per pass attempt. Looking solid, right? But check this out. Look at his game logs, completion percentage, and passer rating. Against Washington, 
50% completions and just a 114 passer rating. Against Texas Tech, 47.4% completions and a 105 passer rating. Against Portland State, a perfect 335.7 passer rating, 64.7% completions. This dude has racked up nearly all of his stats against Portland State. And against the two FBS opponents, he really didn't play that well. Now, does that mean he can't make plays against San Jose State's defense? I mean, I don't know. I, I Look, I really don't know much about this San Jose State team. Um, I will say that when it comes to Emmett Brown, the quarterback, his first big test, his first real road start is on the road in Pullman, a stadium he's very familiar with because he was on the team last year. I like that. I think if there's any tough road test where Emmett Brown would feel comfortable, it's at Washington State. This is his home stadium last year, so I kind of like that for them. Look, again, I, I've said this a number of times. I don't know a ton about San Jose State, so I'm probably going to bet this game. I'm probably going to take the points, but I don't know enough to, to, to tell you to do that. I've talked to a few people I trust that I consider sharp that are taking the points with San Jose State, so I might just tail them. But as far as my betting advice here, I really don't I really don't know. Um, I'm probably just going to bet San Jose State just tailing some people. If you want to see all the bets I currently have open, head over to kylecrums.com and click on Open Bets. Um, also, if you sign up for Sauce Network Plus, it comes with access to the Discord, and you can participate in the weekly betting league. $150 and a trophy go to the winner every single week. Live shows, Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern time, we'll go through the MLB. Saturday morning is the big college football show. 10 a.m. to kick off, we'll be live for two straight hours going through every single game. NFL show, Sunday mornings, 11 a.m. to kick off, we'll go through every single game. If you're able to make it, we'd love to see you in the comments. Let's have ourselves a nice Friday night here, Appalachian State. I mean, the Jets covered, which is cool, um, but Appalachian State, man, what? That might have been the worst performance in Appalachian State football history. Honestly, that was their team total was set at 35 and a half. They scored seven points. Seven. That was what a terrible effort. Uh, so yeah, let's bounce back. Let's have a nice Friday night here. Remember to bet responsibly, and I'll talk to you in the Discord.